Oh God, you created us for kinship. Show us, teach us. Send Jesus, we pray. Amen. I have stood on a cold April day in Auschwitz, the death camp. It was the day after Easter. The gas chambers, cold as well, empty, with tens of thousands perished. I heard no cries there. I have also stood in Dachau, another nation, but also a concentration camp. And that day I heard somebody cry. We were just, we, my family and I, we were just cornering some rich foliage. And there she was, obviously a schoolgirl, obviously in that space with her classmates, and they were all Jews. And she was sobbing. Standing near the brick crematorium that did its dastardly work. A classmate of hers, arm draped over her heaving shoulders. But we don't cry, do we? Maybe we should. We who call ourselves Seventh day Adventist Christians. I'm going to make a statement right now that may be misunderstood somewhere on earth, but I'm compelled to make this statement. And that is when the brief history of time is one day written, and it will be written, I believe it will show that like two matching bookends on the shelf of sacred history, there were and are two faith communities that have occupied the beginning and ending of salvation history story, what in German they call the Heilsgeschichte. Two communities of faith and truth inextricably bound together with a shared fate, that being their divine calling to become the chosen ones. Two communities more than any two in, in the history of religion and time will bear the epitaph, the remnant. And I have a feeling both shall know the meaning of Holocaust. Open your Bible with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7, please. Deuteronomy 7, you see, ever since Adam and Eve's spectacular moral crash and burn in the Garden of Eden. Ever since, there have been two conflicted communities on earth. Two, count them, one, two. Both communities defined by their faithfulness to God or the lack thereof. The majority community rejected God and a minority community embraced Him. And that minority community over the centuries became known as the remnant. First it was the two sons of Adam, Cain and Abel, and the conflict is established. Cain murders Abel. Seth is born, flowing from the same mother and father, two conflicted lines for the rest of Earth's history that morph into friend Noah and the Tower of Babel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. And one day when his brothers stand before him and Joseph announces who he is, this Mr. Prime Minister of Egypt, he speaks these words, and I want you to see them. Look at them carefully. Genesis. Chapter 45, verse 6, God sent me, he says to his brothers, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant, a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Because you see, God has always been preserving a remnant ever since the fall. 
This is no newfangled. This, this, this uh, uh, conference on Adventist identity, the remnant, this is not a newfangled notion. It's been around since the beginning. And when God snatches the remnant out of the jaws of Egypt, he formalizes what we already have sensed is true. He has a chosen people. And when Moses stands before them, here in Deuteronomy 7, on the borders of the promised land, Moses must remind them what we must never forget. God does choose. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Wow. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous or you were more wealthy or you were more intelligent or you were more spread out. No, 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 no. He didn't choose you for that over other peoples for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you. I say, wow, again, whom the Lord loves, he chooses. Listen to Henry Nouwen, the late Henry Nouwen, that marvelous little book of his, The Life of the Beloved. It's an extended letter to a young Jewish male in New York City, and he's writing him to encourage him about his chosenness. Don't abandon it. You're going to read Nouwen's words to this young Jew, but I wish you would think that he's writing to me, okay? Here we go. I beg you, Nouwen writes, do not surrender the word chosen to the world. Dare to claim it as your own, even when it is constantly misunderstood. You must hold on to the truth that you are the chosen one. That truth is the bedrock on which you can build a life as the beloved. When you lose touch with your chosenness, you expose yourself to the temptation of self-rejection. And that temptation undermines the possibility of ever growing as the beloved, end quote. Did you get that line? Never apologize for being chosen. But guess what? This chosen moniker is not only for that community because Peter comes along in the New Testament, grabs De Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, and says, yo, that's you. And he's talking about the likes of you and me. Look at this. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen people. Direct quote, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. How, how did that, now and put it here, I beg you, do not surrender the word chosen to the world. Never apologize for being chosen. Jesus didn't. I'm thinking of that moment once upon a time when the God of the universe who created this planet is incarnated. We just talked about Jacob. We thought about Jacob. Because do you know that when Moses says to Israel before they march into the promised land, he loves you. That word is straight out of Genesis 29 when it, where it reads, and Jacob loved Rachel. And then a little later, and Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. There's some, some kind of choosing going on here. Same word that describes David and Jonathan, Jonathan's friendship. David loved Jonathan. So that word loved, connected with Jacob, fits this moment perfectly because Jesus isn't thinking about the love of Jacob. He's thinking about the well of Jacob and how, in fact, there is, he is hopelessly, helplessly unable, parched and thirsty as he is to just a swallow, please, just too deep, too deep to reach the water. And oh, how we love this story when that, that woman from Samaria shows up. Oh, we love the story. And we get so excited about Jesus offering her water, water that never runs out and you'll never be thirsty again, that we miss the most stunning and provocative statement Jesus makes about the remnant. And I want you to hear it right here. We're going to skip all of that conversation 
And we're going to cut to the chase, the second half of their conversation. John chapter 5, verse 15, and the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus told her, okay, you go call your husband and come back. And you know what happens. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are absolutely right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Blush. How do I change the subject? Oh, you know what? You must be a prophet. That's what we're going to talk about. Let's talk theology. We love theology. Come on, Jesus. Tell me about this, sir. Now that I see that you are a prophet, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. How absolutely political, politically incorrect can you get? And by the way, The Greek has the article in front of salvation, so it really reads, the salvation. What's that mean? Meaning the only salvation there is. Hey, girl, look at me, look at me, look at me. If you're asking me whether the Samaritans have the truth or the Jews have the truth, look at me. Read my lips. The salvation is from the Jews. My, oh, my, oh, my. No flim-flam like some religionists that I know today. All that matters, girl, is that God loves you. Mm Mm-hmm. And you love God. Yep. So don't you worry your pretty little heart about such inconsequential particulars like truth and doctrine, revelation and ethics and behavior. Nah, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Are you crazy? It matters everything. Turns out Buddhism is dead wrong, and so is ecumenism. All paths do not lead to the top of the mountain. Jesus' point is incontrovertible. There is only one path, one truth, one saving grace. And the Jews have been entrusted that truth about this pathway, for they are the chosen ones. They are God's remnant community. Hmm. Hey, listen, folks, come on. Cut Jesus some slack. He is not being arrogant. He's being honest. In fact, when the woman finally speaks again, (laughs) Jesus is more open with her than any other human in all four Gospels when he says, this is who I am. Watch this. He's just stated this, and I'm happy to let it just linger in front of your eyes. I'm not making this up. Jesus claims salvation is from the Jews. And the woman said, oh, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Only in the Greek, it reads this way. I, the one speaking to you, I am. There is no he. We throw that in there to make the sentence feel right. But you see, Jesus, who's loving on this woman now, she's Samaritan to the core. He says, all right, I'll use your Bible. Their Bible is the only, the first five books, isn't it? The Pentateuch, that's the Samaritan Bible. The Hebrew, Hebrew Bible, no, we don't need that. We just need the first five books. So Jesus says, let's take the greatest story in the first five books. When God shows up in a thundering, fiery bush and he cries out, I am that I am. Hallelujah. Jesus says, woman, 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 look at me. I am. I am. 
She pivots on that pretty heel of hers and disappears. The first disciple of Christ in Samaria. All because Jesus was honest and told her the truth. Salvation is from the Jews. And I am the Messiah, the Savior of that salvation. In fact, the the Samaritans were actually the first ones in recorded sacred history to call him Savior of the world. All because he told her the truth. Just as he told the truth to John. John, who composed the, the gospel that we just read from, who will also compose the apocalypsis, the the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus inspires revelation to the elderly John, he makes certain that in the middle of John's writing, right in the middle, there will be only one line about the remnant, but it will be right there where it belongs. You know what that line is, don't you? Oh, I'm sure you do. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. So the dragon, who's the dragon? Help me out here. Who's the dragon? Satan, of course. So the dragon was enraged with a woman. Who's the woman? Pure woman, pure church, impure woman, impure church. This is the pure woman. So the dragon was enraged. Satan was enraged with the church. Now, what what, what about the woman? And went off to make war with the rest. The old King James actually puts it there. Went off to make war with the remnant of her seed, of her children. Whatever whatever group, uh, community this is, it's it's at the end. It's down here. It's the final battle. You remember those two bookends we we alluded to at the beginning? You always need to keep this in mind, the law of the bookends. Maybe you haven't learned this law yet, but I'm going to teach it to you right now. Here's the law of the bookends. If you find one bookend, you will immediately know what the other bookend looks like. True or false? Of course, it's true. So, with the remnant bookends, it would seem to follow that the remnant bookend here at the beginning of the shelf of salvation history, whatever it looks like, we would find a similar revelation in the remnant bookend all the way down here at this side of salvation history. Is that illogical? No, come on. What are you talking about, Dwight? Ah, when Jesus declares salvation is from the Jews, what is it that the Jews, I'm talking about this book in back here, what is it that the Jews stood for? And wouldn't it follow that if they stood for it as the remnant, Whatever the remnant is down here, it would pretty much stand for the same. So we need to find out what they stood for. And I'm going to my American Jew friend, now Seventh-day Adventist Christian, Cliff Goldstein, wrote a book on the remnant. He does a little task for us. It makes it very easy. He's going to now just 11 of them, 11 truths, 11 tenets that define this bookend. Well, at least we'll be clear about this one. All right? So here we go. I'll put them on the screen for you. Looks like I left off the last half of Revelation 12, 17, but I'm glad this, this is happening right now because when it, says the, when it says the remnant here, he's, in, he's enraged with her last seed, it doesn't stop right there. Thank you for the reminder. It actually defines what that remnant, remnant would look like. What does it say? These are they who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Well, that's clear enough for me. Glad we ran into that. But back to the, uh, back to the 11 now. We're going to look at the bookend here. Monotheism, that's it. Goldstein, here's Goldstein. Then amid this parade of polytheism, many, many gods, a small nation of ex-slaves, refugees without their own land, wanderers without a country, proclaimed one of the most radical ideas in antiquity. It's the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Monotheism, number two, divine fiat creation. They had all kinds of mythologies going in the beginning, in the pagan communities. But only the Hebrew scriptures begin with this majestic declaration, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke 
and it was done. Number three, the seventh day Sabbath. Yep. A perpetual palace in time to remind the human race every seventh day that our Creator and our Savior are one and the same. Come to me, he says. Come to me, Jesus invites, and I will give you rest. There are only 11 of these. Here comes number four, the Ten Commandments. Oh, there were codes and civil laws abounding in antiquity, but only one community has a timeless template for human morality called the Decalogue. Yep. Okay, what number is that? That's number four. Let's go to number five, the sanctuary. Oh, plenty of sanctuaries abounded. Pagans had their holy places, temple prostitutes, human sacrifices. But to the remnant of Israel alone is entrusted one simple truth. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No other religion in the history of time, not yet to come, adequately deals with the human problem of sin and God's gift of salvation so profoundly. All right, what's number six? Oh, the truth about death. Oh, my, they had everything going. Those pagan pharaohs and their priests have concocted this nether world of, of unspeakable confusion. But here is this little community that believes that the Creator God has so much power that even when you quit breathing one day, he will restore your breath and you'll wake up as if you've been asleep the whole time. Oh, that's what they believe. What number now? Number seven, optimum health. Oh, that's a good one. In a world ignorant of, of fat and cholesterol, heart disease and cancer, God instills in his remnant a dietary health and preventative health practices far beyond medicinal folklore. That's all they had out there, not this community. Keep going. Number eight, the great controversy paradigm. Well, you know this as well as I. The book of Job is the first written book in the Old Testament. And what's that book about? The great controversy. The internecine war between the father of the universe and a rebel son who now will destroy and nuke this planet and call himself prince of the world. Oh, yeah. The great controversy motif. We know it well. Number nine, spirit of prophecy. To the Hebrews, we still turn. Isn't that true? For the rich legacy of their prophets and prophetic gift, over and against false prophets, God's spirit of prophecy shines like a beacon in earth's midnight darkness. And guess what? Still does. What's the next one? Ten. The final judgment. Ah, deep within their sanctuary liturgy. Only God's remnant could champion the great day of atonement, a prophetic metaphor of the divine judgment that will conclude earth's history with the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And finally, number 11. There's one that's left out. Do you know what it is? Come on. Have you been keeping track? What would number 11 be? Too late. I'll put it on the screen. The coming of the Messiah. The Jews championed the twin comings of the Messiah, but really concentrated on His first coming. And their message, prepare to meet your God, it was a warning to the human race. So there they are, ladies and gentlemen, the ancient but timeless truths. God has always needed a remnant community to champion. I repeat. If there was a remnant community on this side of salvation history that preserved and propagated these 11 timeless truths at the beginning of the salvation story, it would seem most logical that the God who raised up that remnant, remnant would have a remnant at the end of history, human history, that would preserve and propagate the same timeless truths at the ending. Talking about kinship, there you go. But I'm going to end with a warning instead for you in the conference in particular and for the rest of us who joined you today here. The moment we introduce the notion of the chosen and the remnant, as you have so thoroughly done and well done in this conference, the moment we introduce those twin concepts, the chosen and the remnant, we immediately face the danger of hubris, pride, and self-deception. Now listen to me. 
Richard John Newhouse in his marvelous book, Death on a Friday Afternoon, listen to this. God's chosen ones live out the drama and destiny of God Himself. It is a fearful thing to be chosen. It is as though God enters history through His chosen ones. It is a fearful thing to be chosen. Hey, do you, do, do you, you say, why, why is that, Dwight? Do you remember the thoroughly unchosen, unremnant, pagan Roman centurion that met Jesus one day and Jesus ends up with this stunning commendation of him? Do you remember that story about the Roman? And he says, listen, I got a servant that's dead, but is going to die. But if you don't, you don't have to come to my house. No, you, you just stay right here. Jesus, just stay right here. Speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus pivots on his sacred heel and he announces to the crowd that's around in Matthew 8, verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly, I may I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. He's talking about the chosen. He's talking about the remnant. I found nobody amongst the remnant, amongst the chosen with faith like this pagan Roman. But he goes on. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west. And they will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who are in the first bookend in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, they will. They'll sit down beside these heroes. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where they will be weeping and ganashing of teeth. He's talking about the, the chosen. The people who are carrying their, their membership card, I'm chosen. The people who say, no, 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 I'm a part of the remnant. You don't throw me out. He says, oh, really? Try me. There will be great weeping and nest. God, I have the membership card. All 11 tenants, I memorized them. I stood for them. I taught them in the seminary. I got the card to prove it. But the subject of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weep, weeping and gnashing of teeth. My, 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 my. It is a fearful thing to be chosen. Newhouse is right, which leads me to this conclusion. The remnant today has to be more movement than institution. More movement than institution. Nobody gets a membership card in the remnant. You can't join it. You can't sign up. It's a movement. The remnant today is more movement than institution. As Goldstein like only Cliff can, puts it, membership in the corporate remnant no more guarantees salvation than membership in a health club guarantees good health. So you got a membership over here. I got one. I've never used it, but I'm healthy. Look at me. He makes the point. That's why, by the way, the remnant is more about mission than museum. Oh, I'm talking to a community of faith that loves to curate its museum. Oh, bring them out, put them on the shelf, dust them off. Oh, 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 look at these 11. Don't they shine with luster? Curating ourselves into an institution when this is a mission that has no walls and no membership cards. Oh, Listen, I, I, and I don't want to be misunderstood, so I have to insert this right here. I believe all the 11. Yes, I do. In fact, I believe that you will not find them anywhere else on earth but with the remnant. So you, don't have, you, you have no argument with me. Which is why the remnant's raison d'etre is not to keep people out our mission is to bring people in. Just bring them in. Just bring them in. Get them in. 
The angels will do the sorting, by the way. You just throw the net, Jesus says. You just throw the net. Bring. I don't care what comes in. Take what comes in. And you love on them. That's why the remnant's modus operandi is not exclusion. It's inclusion. This choosing business is about inclusion. Whom God loves, he chooses, and he loves everybody. He has chosen everybody to be saved. And the remnant exists to sound that word. I know you have a different lifestyle than me. I know that you have a different set of beliefs than I do. But I'm here to tell you, the Lord Jesus himself is inviting you, step in. You remember that, the woman of Samaria? The Jews excluded her. Jesus includes her. Come on, girl. You're in. You don't need a card. You're in. That pagan Roman centurion, the Jews drove him away. But Jesus draws him in. Love on the move. That's what Pioneer's mission is. Love on the move. That was Jesus' mission. Love on the move wherever he went. Draw them in with such winsome love, which is why the American writer Ellen White was spot on when she reduces the last appeal to this little bookend down here with these words. Christ's Object Lessons, page 415. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. What's that message? The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of God's character of love. So the next time you have a conference, maybe you did it in this conference, have somebody go through the 11 and show how they are bedrocked in the love of God. That'll be a contribution for the, wild, for the wider church, and we need it. So keep that bright mind of yours working. The last message of mercy is a revelation of his character of love, which is why we call such love, I don't know where this line came from, the truth as it is in Jesus. That's it. That's it. <laughs> because Jesus said to the woman, I am. I am what? Oh, just before they killed him, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And that's the truth about the remnant. One word. It's a name. Jesus. Amen. 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 Our Connect card today, electronic, you can use it by taking your phone out and just text the word REMNANT to 269-281-2345. Here are the three options today. See if one of these might work for you. I want to follow Jesus and embrace His REMNANT truths. I suppose everybody here would say, oh, could count me in on that one. Maybe you're, maybe you're listening right now. Maybe you're watching right now, and you say, no, no, this is new stuff for me. Put a check mark there. Let me send something to you. All right, box number two. Please send me more information on those 11 teachings of the REMNANT. Be happy to do that. Put a check mark there. I'll make sure they get to you electronically. No mailing address. In a split second, you'll have them. Box number three, I want to sign up for the Pure Desire Conference. Oh, boy, that's next weekend, isn't it? My, 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 my. This campus has been talking about this Pure Desire Conference for a bunch of weeks now, and we here in Pioneer are doing it as well. I hope you'll be there. This is not a conference for, every, for everybody who is known to have sexual addiction problems. We'll all be there together. They're inviting students across the board. I was in the seminary lecturing this week. Come on, guys, sign up. Ladies, come on. It's going to be in the seminary chapel Friday night and all day Sabbath. I'm going to be there. We're asking the elders here to be there. We're asking parents to be there. We're asking children to be there. We're asking you to come. If you will check that, I'll send you a website. You can make the decision in the quiet of your own space. Put a check mark there. I'll send you a website. All the details will be there. If you're a student, college student, we're going to cut the price for you down to 25 bucks. And you'll see how to do that, the code you'll put in in order to get that. I want to sign up for the Pure Desire Conference. 
I want to pray with you right now. Please. Oh, God. Please. Let us follow Jesus. The eleven tenets, he embraced them. Why wouldn't I? To keep people out? No, we just watched him twice draw someone in who had never been in before. So use us to be like Jesus and do just that. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Send us out now. And love through us. Let us be love on the move for you. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. The fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we're needing to make constant upgrades to our technology. So if God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Not a single penny of your donation will go to me. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website, newperceptions.tv, or call the number, you know the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. And may the God who has blessed you continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.